Hey guys, I'm Lindsay Ponder, and today we're starting the Book of Philippians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the very first church he planted. In this time we have set aside today to seek God's presence, I want to invite you, let God's word wash over you. Has your mind been racing? Has your spirit been anxious? God's word is a refuge from the winds of life for us, a place where we encounter God himself and find help and hope for our daily lives, as well as a challenge for us to grow. Now, Paul wrote this letter from prison, so if you can, imagine how the Philippians must have hung on every word as it was read aloud, because there was no telling when they would hear from their founding pastor again. Imagine the intentionality with which Paul must have selected these instructions. These words were of the utmost importance, and they're important for us today, too. If you've ever found yourself confused by all the conflicting messages and definitions of truth in our world today, or in your various relationships, if you've ever asked, what is really true here? Or wondered how to respond to the circumstances you find yourself in, then Philippians is the book for you. Paul chose to open this powerful letter to the Philippians with a beautiful prayer that holds the key for all of us in how to respond to the world with spiritual wisdom not in the way we normally would. Listen as I read Philippians 1, 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now, Paul's praying about love, which probably seems pretty standard. Our world is obsessed with love, and there's tons of different definitions for it. Or maybe just one, that it can basically look like whatever you want it to. But that kind of love, our culture's definition of love, is actually the opposite of how God defines love. Because it's rooted in selfishness. Selfishness that results in indifference to anything that doesn't benefit how I want to live. But Paul is actually defining love in a specific way here. He's not praying for love that is mere emotion or sentiment. Paul is praying for love that manifests itself how? In knowledge and discernment. And Paul's not talking about mental assent either. Paul's talking about deep knowledge of God. Knowledge that looks like intimacy. Knowledge that looks like God's wisdom and counsel. It's God's love that causes us to grow in discernment, which is the ability to see and respond to the world in the way God himself would. Paul gives us three results this loving discernment has in our lives. Number one, if you are abounding more and more in love, you will be able to approve the things that are excellent. You know what that means? It means you have the priorities of your life figured out. It means you know more than just the difference between good and bad, right and wrong. You know the difference between good and better, better and best. The difference between what is merely acceptable and what is truly excellent. And oh, by the way, Paul's not talking about just anybody's definition of excellence here. He's not talking about the excellent way to climb the corporate ladder or make it big in music or have everyone you know like you. Paul's talking about the kind of excellence we see in Jesus Christ who lived in righteousness to the point of laying down his life for love. Love makes us acknowledge and choose what God calls excellent. Number two, if you are abounding more and more in love, you will be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. What does this mean? Paul's just building on his argument here. If you abound in love so that you can discern what is the very best of God's best for you, you will very naturally begin to live purely and blamelessly, producing righteous fruit. And yes, that righteousness came first as a free gift of grace from Jesus Christ, but now we walk in it. Love makes us live in such a way that if Christ were to return today, you would have the humble confidence to meet him face to face, knowing that he would lift your head and say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Love makes us live in a way that allows others to see Jesus in us. Number three, if you are abounding more and more in love, you will bring glory and praise to God. 
there's a beautiful twofold relationship Paul is describing here. On the one hand, as we realize Jesus has shared his own righteousness with us as a gift, we should praise and glorify him for loving us. But also, as we live out of an abounding love for God and others, our lives themselves become sources of glory and praise to God. He is pleased when we live this way. Love makes our lives take on a sweet aroma of praise pleasing to our God. So whether you're at the beginning or end of this day of fasting, I encourage you, read Philippians 1 and consider this. God's goal for all of us is spiritual maturity, which includes looking at and responding to things from a spiritual perspective, not in the way we normally would. When we let love for God and others drive our decisions, we automatically start to respond to the world in the way Jesus himself would. During this fast, we need to practice the courage it takes to be honest with ourselves. So as you read, ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Is your life bearing fruit in the way Paul describes? Are your priorities aligned with God's? Is your life bearing fruit in righteousness? If not, we have a love problem at the root of it all. If our life priorities get out of whack, we know that somewhere along the way, we let something else creep in and take first place in our hearts. And if that's the case, this season of fasting is the perfect time to confess that to the Lord, to ask for His forgiveness, and to receive His grace. No matter where you find yourself today, Paul promises you this in Philippians 1.6. I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not finished with you or me or any of us. In fact, what God starts, he always finishes. And when God finishes a work, he stands back, smiles at you in love and says, yes, this is very good. God bless you guys.